I'm Keith Shaw, Vice President of Strategy and Technology at Advantest, and you are listening to Advantest Talks Semi. Those in the semiconductor field may have read recently that VLSI Research, the industry's foremost provider of market research and economic analysis covering the semiconductor supply chain, was acquired by Tech Insights, a Canada-based provider of advanced technology analysis and IP services. There seems to be great synergy between the two groups, and we are happy to know that VLSI Research will continue to provide the same invaluable business intelligence and insights that they have for the past 45 years. Full disclosure, Advantest subscribes to VLSI Incorporated Research Reports. To talk more about this and learn about the latest semiconductor industry trends, I'm pleased to welcome Risto Puhaka to our podcast. Risto is president of VLSI Research and leads the company's commercial operations and market research activities. Risto, welcome to Advantest Talk Semi. Thank you, Keith. It's a really big pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's all ours. So, Risto, first, what can you tell us about the acquisition of VLSI Research by Tech Insights? Yes, it's a quite exciting news, obviously, changing the ownership. And uh, on a personal note, it, for me, it's been like letting a kid first time into a candy store. You know, there's so many different things you can do and Marvel and, and everything else. It's been really actually interest from a personal, professional level. But the basics are that basically VLSI Research uh, continues to operate as a subsidiary of Tech Insights. And more importantly, all of our key people uh, stay so all of our key analysts are, are staying with the company and continues as they are, as well as our product. All of the products are complementary to Tech Insights, as, as Tech Insights in the reverse engineering and IP analysis side, and we are in the market statistics and economic side. And really, the broad issue there is that how can we merge the uh, reverse engineering analysis with the economic analysis and start to bring more technology type of forecast into the into the picture and that's really the big picture why this uh, acquisition took place and and we are actually all excited to really make it successful going forward yeah thanks for that big picture overview and i think you and i talked before i've used those tech insights breakdowns quite a bit in the past so i'm looking forward to how they can be used with convergence via lsi all right so then let's talk about the latest trends we live in an increasingly connected world in which an explosive demand for semiconductors is leading to a growing addressable market. And we'll see some of that market growth here in a minute. But there's this thirst for intelligence in the forms of reverse engineering data and informed analysis, as you just described. And there are all these drivers such as 5G, machine learning, really smart everything, including automobiles. And all of that's feeding this frenzy. In Advantest July 2021 briefing, we indicated that the SOC tester market has increased from around 3 billion to 3.8. So that's an 800 million increase. And the memory test increased from 1.2 billion to 1.4. So another 200 million in aggregate about 1 billion. So Risto, tell us what is going on? Really what's going on, we, we really have the, the situation where the COVID-related economic impact has created a fantastic conditions for the uh, electronics demand, semiconductor demand. And then obviously it's, or unfortunately, it's been magnified also, especially this year through the shortage season supply chain constraints, which, which has added another layer of, of growth on, on, on all of this. You look at the, look at the general numbers, it's just that from the numbers perspective, we are looking into electronics growing uh, 15, 16% this year. We look at the uh, ICs growing 26% this year. And we have also semiconductor equipment growing in, uh, in about 40% range. In uh, tests, we're likely to see 30% growth rates. So all of that is aligned exactly what you described on advantage numbers. And really, this is this is one of the fantastically great years from the top line business perspective. But it's a tough year from the supply chain perspective to able to deliver 
everything that the customers need. So that's kind of the uh, the thing is there. If you look at a little bit going forward, like 22, 23, 24 timeframe, ourselves, we're a little bit concerned that is the industry getting ahead of itself. We, we kind of see the spending ex- exceed what the fundamentals are in a, in a long-term basis. So base, mm-hmm. it's basically mean we are well above the, the mean, what we would expect from the, from the average growth rate perspective. That relates to, you know, our forecast scenarios, you know, forecast ratios are kind of off the charts then uh, the question is how those those will be correcting themselves going forward and right now there is also we see the external funding starting to flow into the industry in terms of uh, governments getting into supporting establishing local manufacturing so so there is a lot huge number of really positive drivers in place and then there is our own internal concerns related to managing the forecast I think we have a similar concern. I mean, how how much of that speculation is due to the inventory buildup? One of the things we, we don't have good visibility into is sort of this double buying or ordering due to the supply chain restrictions. So does VLSI account for any of those in the numbers? We count for it and we actually do track the, the general inventory levels and, and they are not alarming. And, and that there's a couple of things there. I mean, let's let's go first. Yes, total inventory number is, is definitely growing. There's no, no question about that. However, when you look at the inventory to billings ratio, it remains the inventories are actually in a reasonable level. You know, it's basically across the industry, we are below 1.5 months. Typically, that's the trigger point when we start to think the inventories are getting too high. But then, uh, just to answering again this this question, there is definitely double ordering. There is definitely triple ordering. But the, but since there is so much uh, supply constraints, it tends to limit that that inventory growth. On the other side, also the electronics is growing at a very nice rate, and and that's really helping. On the, again, the, there is the consumption at the same time. So we have all of those things, and we don't see inventories as a huge issue at this moment in time. However, if this business slows, let, let's say rapidly, then of course the inventories would become an issue pretty quickly. But the, at the current state, we don't see the inventories really, really being a hugely concerning issue. Okay, good. That's good to hear. So then let's move on to some forecast. Uh, recently, Yoshiaki Yoshida, CEO of Advantest, he was interviewed on Nikkei CNBC's Ask the Top. And he said, quote, I think there is no doubt that semiconductors have become part of our social infrastructure, end quote. This caught my attention. I like that observation. And I feel like this, quote, semiconductors as social infrastructure is one of the big key underlining factors driving a lot of the growth trends and plays into some of the long-term forecast. We see, of course, many new applications driving the semi-demand, and it feels like semiconductors are becoming increasingly integrated into nearly every facet. We just need some help partitioning what what that means in terms of traditional versus new and how that pertains to the long-term forecast. So can you help us out there? Yeah. First of all, if we really start to go and talk to the the long-term forecast, I mean, I want to mention this, that we still have the Moore's law playing a role because the industry can lower the the cost per transistor on a very predictable rate at about 20% rate per year. From that perspective, basically the computing power, the increase of computing power is becoming ongoingly more affordable. So you get more computing power and its price remains essentially the same. So then you start to look into how this, this kind of breaks down into, into various areas. First of all, we see really uh, the breadth of applications and opportunities to we really haven't seen over the last 20 years. You know, historically, we had a mo- the mobile era, there was the cell phone era, there was the smartphone era, and so there was a, one specific driver. Those drivers are still strong. You know, we still see that these, what I would call traditional drivers, you know, mobile, data center, and, and PC, it's, it's, they're very much in place. So interesting. By traditional, do you, do you mean era three in the VLSI's long-term forecast that goes out to 2030. I've seen that and I've actually uh, utilized that slide. Um, It's very useful. You have it broken into four distinct eras, which is a great way to describe it, especially with this new era four AI and convergence. So what, what is meant by era four? Okay. And that's, uh, that's actually one of, one of our slides where we look at these, these different kind of 
eras or generations. And where we go is uh, you you kind of look at this this convergence of how the data integrates the society, so to speak. So it has the corner is, of course, is the AI of it, artificial intelligence, and, and it's, it, it requires extremely powerful chips, as we know. Then we can go through EVs, you know, they're going to be integrated, that network. We have a basically almost electrification of, of everything or networking of everything. You know, we you kind of look at that as a really fundamental key drivers, like so, something like the mobile was five, ten years ago. So that's that's really one of the areas we look. Then the second thing, which is really starting to emerge, and, and we, we kind of start to believe that there is there is actually a lot there in terms of the silicon and semiconductors, is this electrification of everything as an environmental driver. And this is really moving to green energy. Green energy sourcing is, is really something that we, we start to think that, hey, there is actually quite a bit of opportunities. It may not be the classic so powerful processor that is, is key on that, but there's a lot of power devices. There's, uh, let's say, more simpler devices, but they're going to be maybe in a higher power range. And, and those are, they are semiconductors. They need equipment, they need testing, they need fabs, and, and all of that, that, that drivers. And, and it's quite easy to start to see that uh, that long-term forecast that, you know, the industry will reach one trillion in sales in 2030s. The, the current forecast estimates it's 2031. The year is not actually important on that. The important thing is that the semiconductor sales doubles in the foreseeable future. And the issue there is how we as an industry should look at that. But what would the supply chain look like? kind of a role Advantage will play in the industry, which is in $1 trillion. What is the role for TSMC? What is the role for Intel? Of course, everybody has their roles. And, and then it's how we can work together as an industry to really actually support $1 trillion business. Who would have ever thought we would see $1 trillion and it's coming quicker than we think? Okay, so let's move on to supply chain challenges. Seems like every day we hear a new news piece that talks about supply chain challenges and it's affecting our entire ecosystem. What's the status and is it getting better anytime soon? So let's go first that, you know, supply chain is, is different parts of the supply chain. And then the semiconductor manufacturers have received their beating, really their beating over the last nine months of not able to supply at the rates that the end users have asked for. And there is a number of reasons we can look at those, but the, the fundamental issue is the demand has exceeded the supply. The industry has reacted very strongly on it and 40% growth rate for equipment sales or 30% on testers is, is really the reaction to it. So with that, that level of growth, there is actually a substantial amount of capacity going into place in all parts of semiconductor supply chain. And we actually start to believe, and some of our analysis shows that the semiconductor supply issue should start to abate on the fourth quarter. We, we've been saying that for a while now, and we, we still, every time we look at it, we come to about the same conclusion. Now, that doesn't mean that the, the whole supply chain is, is recovering and be able to deliver the way the end users like. For example, there you may have situations with the module makers that they have to shut down because of COVID-19. And you have the supply of semiconductors, but you don't have the modules to ship to the, assemble the final products. So there is actually the whole supply chain is, is kind of on its way to healing, but having these disruptions ongoingly that, that impacts on how the end users experience the marketplace. So that's kind of the first level on that. And then I always want to want to say that every component, every part of the supply chain is critical. So testers are a critical part of the supply chain. Nothing ships until, unless the IC is shipped. And testers need integrated circuits, and they, they are challenged with that integrated circuit supply as well. So it's very understandable for from that perspective. Then if you look at a little bit from the broader view, the supply chain, how it's changing around, we see uh, basically regional diversity increasing. So essentially we see Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam as a part of the supply chain, more into the module side and assembly side increasing. And then we see actually new companies uh, starting to emerge also in these locations. So again, the, the market, so-called free market reacts to these changes and pressures what's going on. And then finally, we actually even see new semiconductor companies emerging in the marketplace, especially in uh, trailing edge components, and they typically come from China. 
So it's it's quite interesting, uh-huh. and uh, and but we believe it's 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 healing quite quickly here from that very high demand environment. So I want to touch on or dive a little bit deeper on one of those topics. So the, the sub modules, the subsystems. What I heard is it sounds like those are going to persist a little bit longer with the shortages. Is that because those that part of the supply chain is more manual where you, have, you just have more people that need to be involved and COVID prevents that from happening? Yes, Keith, that's exactly the case. The issues have been that uh, original source was, hey, there is no chips available at the rate that's required. Now that the chips are start to be available, you start to see that, hey, the bottleneck is moving to the module and subcomponent level or subsystem level. And, and one area that is that, you know, it is more manual assembly, needs more people. You have had COVID-related shutdowns, you know, in, in various countries. Then suddenly you have the, the supply chain disruption coming from that area. So so that's kind of the uh, the, the gist of it, that it's it, the recovery of the supply chain kind of moves from uh, one area to the next until it gets all the way to the client customer. Okay, good. So speaking of people and poss- potentially people shortages, moving to our next topic, do you see manufacturing returning to the U.S. and EU? To sort of set that up, the way I see it, the combination of robotics and AI is potentially a manufacturing game changer. So for example, we see Boston Dynamics, Robot Dog Spot. It's a perfect example Elon Musk recently unveiled Tesla Bot last week, which he says is going to be available in 2022. To me, that seems impossible, but he's become quite famous at doing the impossible. And then, of course, we have Amazon that has already over 200,000 plus robots automated their warehouses. And I believe just a few years ago, that was only 100,000. So that I think that's doubled. I guess the Question is, what happens or what could happen if the robotics and AI convergence meet cost parity with these outsourced tasks, especially in light of the increased security tensions and concerns? Yeah, I mean, first of all, the, these, these are actually great automation examples. They're just fantastic technologies. The interesting part is that these technologies are available to, to everyone. It's, it's not that it's confined to United States or Europe or, or Asia exclusively. All regions have access to these these technologies. And then the question is how they're going to implement it. In general, there is now a very clear pressure that we would start to get, uh, let's call it onshoring. So certain manufacturing functions would be kind of coming to United States or Europe. And they are driven at by, again, supply chain diversity perspective, or they are driven by countries uh, or regions security security perspective. And in this case, I'm, I'm referring to the United States. Governments, countries start to have incentives in place, programs in place that would economically encourage moving uh, moving manufacturing to these regions, primarily United States and Europe. Now, when you look at that situation, the first thing you have to kind of admit, which is basically a data point that, you know, about 85% of semiconductor manufacturing is in Asia Pacific region. And uh, the second one is that North America, United States, and Europe does have a cost disadvantage. So then the question is, what can you do with these these things? And uh, and of course, the, the cost disadvantage can be alleviated with the government programs, and and uh, you can move that parity in place. Other factor is that the Asia Pacific region is not going to give up their market share freely. They will. They are tough competitors, and and they will innovate as well as the United States will innovate, as well as Europeans will innovate. Everybody will innovate. Then it's it's basically becomes this uh, kind of com- competition of where it's manufactured and who is the best manufacturer. So in in our expectation, there has been this trend that. United States and Europe has been losing share over the decades, and and the trend lines are clear, and the charts are out there. Our expectation is that this trend line is most likely leveling off. There may be one, maybe two percent gains back to the United States, but we don't really expect a huge reversal of that trend in a long term basis. But we would expect that trend would kind of level off and in, in a long term basis. So that's kind of the manufacturing returning to US and Europe. 
there are great programs right now in place. You know, we, we know Arizona has a lot of investments going in in the Phoenix area. There are others in, uh, in upstate New York and, and other programs in place. So things are definitely moving that direction. But all the Asia Pacific countries are tough competitors. Yeah, I think your comment about them not giving up the market share easily is the most poignant. Just anecdotally, there was a robotics manufacturer that went into a large manufacturer in Asia and could show that they could do it more efficient and less costly. And the manufacturer basically just lowered the labor cost and says, <laughs> oh, we're, we're keeping it here. So they still have plenty of margin. So Risto, I think we're we're about run out of time, but I want to say your invaluable insights have given us a, a lot to think about. Um, one thing is clear. The semiconductor industry future is looking pretty bright. I've never seen it look this good and seen the outlook be this long. I'd like to once again thank you and VLSI Research for coming on Advantest Talk Semi and would like to invite you back soon with some other more interesting updates. It's been very nice to be here and a lot of fun. Thank you, Keith. Thanks, Risto. To round out this episode, Kara is here with some advanced test updates. Kara? Thanks, Keith. We will soon be kicking off the planning for the 2022 Advantest Voice Developer Conference, which will take place May 17 to 18 in Scottsdale, Arizona. As usual, the voice call for papers will open in October. If you would like to submit an abstract, please watch for the announcement of next year's technology tracks, process, and deadlines. Details will be posted on the Voice website at voice.advantes.com. You can subscribe for voice email updates via the website as well. Also, our listeners in Europe can catch up with Advantes at Semicon Europa, which will take place November 16 to 19. And as always, be sure to connect with Advantest on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn for all the news and much more. Keith, that's the latest. Back to you. Great. Thanks, Hera. Well, that does it for this episode. Hope you enjoyed it and see you next time on Advantest Talks Simi. Mm-hmm.